Welcome to a full length online poetry workshop. Um, I haven't done a two minute and a five minute uh, workshop previously. This feels epic. Um, this is part of the Shades of Tea project. Um, it's the guys at the Rocker Festival Theatre are running and hopefully we'll work towards um, the poetry competition which is part of that project. It's great that in this time of lockdown and all that's going on, the guys at the, the Festival Theatre have um, not just cancelled things but found alternative ways to keep them going. In this workshop I'm going to split into to three parts and um, each part will end with a, an exercise that you can go and try. Um, this first part we're going to look at different approaches to, to how to actually just start writing and how to sit down and write a poem. But um, why bother writing poetry at all? Um, I can tell you a little bit about my journey into poetry and why poetry for me. Um, which is a, a number of years ago, about 12 years ago, my wife got a, a poetry book for her birthday by the American poet Ruth Stone. We were there in her parents' living room and I uh, picked up the, this present she'd got and just flipped it open. I had no interest at all in poetry up until this point. But I flicked this, the book open randomly at a poem called Green Apples and I was instantly transported from her, my in-law's living room to a porch in Vermont and the wind was blowing up through the valley and it was shaking the apple trees and the apples were falling onto a tin roof and rolling down and there's a family on the porch and, I, and then suddenly, just as suddenly, I was back in the living room in my in-law's house again. And I was just fascinated by how so few words, it's a short poem, and so few words were able to take me to somewhere I had never, I'd never physically been to Vermont before. But in that moment, I felt like I had, I had been there and experienced this, this small town <laughs> on a porch in an orchard. And um, I was just fascinated by this. And so I spent, after that, I just wanted to read poetry and I spent a, a couple of years where I read nothing but poetry. I didn't write anything during that time, I was just reading poetry and I think searching continually for more poems like that that would just transport me. And I enjoyed other forms of poems within that as well and then every now and again I would come across another small poem that would just transport me again. And then other ones that would um, yeah, lead to different ways of thinking or it's just something about the brevity of it and how so much is packed into such a small space really appealed and then when I started writing poems myself dabbling in it I found that the similar thing would happen I, I would trans I would go from wherever I was sitting writing to somewhere else and I would be you know maybe a spot back in my childhood or another country I'd been to or just somewhere else I would I would be there and be writing and I'd be exploring it, reliving it in some ways, making sense of it in, in new ways and and then poetry has become something central and essential to life I would say and um, a need or a must. Like it's just it's something that a compulsion I suppose to explore the world in that way and make sense of things going on around me and make sense of myself within that. I would say that life for me is enriched by writing poetry and I hope that if you try some of these exercises and start getting into it that you might experience the same thing because I know how much it has meant for me and it feels almost lucky that I've stumbled upon it and so hopefully in a similar way this you know trying it you never know what you'll find it might uh, a similar experience for you. But how to, how to go about sitting down and starting to write a poem? I've mentioned reading. Read, reading other poems is important. Um, but also um, just finding different ways to, to get into to actually writing. And there's no one way, that's the thing, there's no one way for a person to write. There's no correct way to do it. So I'm going to share a number of different ways that <clears throat> people have tried different exercises and things that people do. 
One of those is stream of consciousness. And that's the idea that you take a piece of paper, take a pen, and you just write down whatever comes into your head. Just random words, disjointed sentences, sentences that don't make sense, swear words all over, whatever, just whatever comes into your head. Um, and an important part of that exercise for some people is that afterwards they crumple it up, put it in a bin, or ceremoniously burn it somewhere. This idea that no one's going to ever read it. Um, but that you, yeah, getting rid of it at the end of it can be an important part. Not Again, not for everyone though. Some people like to keep it almost as a log of their <laughs> um, subconscious flow over, over time. Um, another way, another exercise that people use, writing exercise, is to set aside time in the beginning of listening. You just write down a list of places you've been, pets you've had, relatives, friends, people you've met, TV shows, it can be anything, a list, whatever you want to, to write, just a list. And then the next part of that is you pick and then you expand. So you pick one thing from that list and then you expand it out. You just build on it, build around it, write around it at one point. So you take the big list, pick it, narrow it down, and then you expand around that. So those are two writing exercises, neither of which work particularly well for me. I know a lot of people who have said that these, these things work really well for them. For me, I, I have done them and it, it's been fine. But I have a different approach to writing, which I'll, I'll share with you. <coughs> Um, I find that quite often asked where where do you get your ideas from? Where does the idea come from? For me, if I I only know that if I set aside time to sit down and write, get a book open, it's probably not going to be an idea. Will come. I, I find that if I try and structure it too much, it, it doesn't happen for me. Whereas other people using my technique <laughs> would struggle with that but my, my way of doing it is just to have a, a notebook or a, and a pencil and pen with me at all times I just carry a small a small notebook with me everywhere and a, a pencil with me and quite often the idea will come at the most inappropriate moment or time but uh, I'm always ready to catch it anyway so I'm quite often um, stopped by you know it's quite often when I'm cycling or walking when I'm cycling to work and back, or, or if I'm out walking, something possibly about the rhythm of those things and the, the way it connects with my mind, then suddenly I'll have an idea. And quite often it's not words, or it's not an idea in terms of a, trying to think what it is. It's a feeling, it's the feeling that comes first, which is why I need to get it in the moment. Because a feeling, for me, it's harder to hold on to that and then capture it in words at a later time. I need to get a time where I, when I'm still in the feeling of it, and uh, at that point, it's just it is a scroll in a notebook, very quickly, illegible. Quite often because it's it's written with cold hands at a roadside somewhere, or um, when I'm quickly I'm supposed to be somewhere else and I'm quickly scribbling it down. Um, so yeah, it's in it's very much in that that moment and I have to have it with me. Again, going back to Ruth Stone, the poet that I mentioned, she described this um, for her that she'd be out working in the garden or orchard or doing something and she would almost feel the poem coming towards her up the valley and she would have to stop what she was doing and literally run to get a piece of pen and a, a notebook and um, she would have to capture it because she said quite, quite a beautiful thing almost that if she didn't capture it, that idea or that feeling would continue until it found someone else who was going to capture it in words. Um, something about that appeals to me. There's a, a sort of mysterious side to this almost, and a fragility about it, which is a little bit scary at times because it feels like, well, I suppose I'm haunted by the words of Philip Barkin, who, um, when he was asked why he'd left poetry, Apparently he uh, he answered that he didn't read poetry. Poetry left him. So I do worry with this approach to poetry that um, it might leave me one day, or that another idea won't come at some time. 
So and the videos get a little bit twitchy after a few days if I've not written anything, but but that's over a decade now of uh, writing poems and um, they're still coming. So uh, fingers crossed. So the exercise then at the end of this, I'm going to finish with a poem um, by Ruth Stone, but before we do that, let me just outline the exercise at the end of this part. The exercise is to try these different ways and see if any of them work for you or you might find something else entirely. But first of all, try stream of consciousness. So take a piece of paper, just write down whatever comes into your head and you can burn it at the end, crumple it up, chuck it in the bin, shred it, whatever, or keep it. Just play around with stream of consciousness, right? See, what, uh, see how that feels for you. And then try listening. Um, that exercise of just writing a list, then picking, then expanding. And then finally, in your daily exercise or your daily escape in these um, times, take a piece of paper with you and a pen or a pencil and just see what comes. See if you feel anything and just try and capture it in the moment. See how that goes. The poem, Green Apples, I'm going to gonna finish with that as part of the of the uh, workshop and then you can go and do your uh, exercise. Green Apples by Ruth Stone. In August we carried the old horsehair mattresses to the back porch and slept with our children in a room. The wind came up the mountain and into the orchard telling me something, saying something urgent. I was happy. The green apples fell on the sloping roof and rattled down. The wind was shaking me all night long, shaking me in my sleep, like a definition of love, saying this is the moment, here, now. Welcome to uh, part two of the poetry workshop. This part we're going to look at briefly at the editing process um, and then we'll go on to look at uh, devices for writing um, in particular prospopia which we will come back to. Um, the first the editing process you've got scribbled stuff you've done stream of consciousness or you've written a list and expanded on bits or you've um, now you've got you know written down a, a feeling captured a feeling or an idea what do you do with it then? Um, because it's rare that you end up writing a poem. I, I don't know many poets who would say they've written a poem straight off. I've had, on two, out of hundreds and hundreds of poems that I've written, I've had two occasions where a poem arrives and lands on the page pretty much in its final form. Two poems out of hundreds. It's very nice when it happens, but um, most of the time there's an editing process. And there's a sort of physical element to it for me. Um, I need the, the initial freedom to just scribble in a book is quite important for me. I, I know that it doesn't matter what I write in some ways because if someone picked it up, they would struggle to read it anyway um, because of my uh, initial scrawl. Um, so there's that. There's something about that having the freedom just to get it down, just to capture something. And then the next stage for me is in that same notebook then when I have more time um, um, you know, I'll be scratch, scribbling bits out, adding bits in, tweaking it and changing it there within that notebook and nudging it towards a more fuller form. But then there's, there's another step that I find works is whenever I take the um, news from that notebook physically to the next bit and I enjoy then something that slows me down a little bit. So I use uh, one of these old traditional dip pens. So a fountain pen, just dip it in the ink and then and write the old way and that slows me down and also improves my writing. And that gets transferred then into a, another notebook, which is almost, the poem I'd say then is pretty close to final form when it gets to that stage. But there is then, Another, another step to that, and that's when I transfer the poem from that book to a digital version. 
sort of type it up on a computer. There's a bit more tweaking can go on then as well. So it's a yeah three steps for me. There's the scribbling it down initially and the tweaking and the note small notebook that I have with me all the time, and then there's the next step to the the other notebook and writing more slowly and consciously knowing that it's going towards a final version that other people at that stage might um, read or hear um, and that uh, that's what I use whenever I set aside time for writing it's never for to try and start with a new idea and write it down it's always the editing process I find there's a queue of poems build up because I'm scribbling them down so I usually have a small notebook or a couple of small notebooks that are just there ready to take to that next stage and then beyond that as I say onto the keyboard and digital version <clears throat> so there's going to be different ways that it work for different people as there is with actually getting the, the start of the idea but play around with it and find what works for what works for you so moving on to the device that we can write with, um, you've got your idea in countless ways you can go with it. There's a whole, so many ways that you can, you could take it, context you can put it in or approaches you can take to it. The device of prosopopoeia is the one I've been focusing on um, for this project. Um, and prosopopoeia is, it's a generic term for when you give voice or when you communicate with the audience from the perspective of something that's either inanimate or is an animal or something that wouldn't normally have human voice or human attributes and you use that as a device to present the work. It's a, it can be quite a powerful um, effective way of, of getting thinking about things in a different way or getting the reader to think about things in a different way. It's also partly why um, apparently Plato would have uh, he would have banned poets from the Republic from his ideal idyllic place the Republic he would have banned all poets um, and Plato wrote that the tragic poet is an imitator and therefore like all other imitators he is thrice removed from king and from the truth so the the poet he, he had an issue because he felt that it, it would move people away from truth. Whereas actually what a lot of people find is that no, you discover truths through um, exploring it from other angles. Um, Quintilian, the Quintilian, the Roman educator, he wrote that uh, the power of this figure of speech is to bring down the gods from heaven, evoke the dead and give voices to cities and states. There's a real strength in that. And there's, um, again, animals quite often, you know, particularly in children's literature, our animals are inhabited and they're given a voice, they're given a human voice. And um, Alice in Wonderland, it was banned in China, not because of it alluded so much to drug taking and that sort of thing, but because the animals spoke. So Alice in Wonderland got itself banned in China. Um, it's the same year that the authorities there banned the use of the letter N. So, um, but yeah, the, so this, there is a, there's a certain strength to this way of writing, a difference, it, it's coming out of slant, which quite often poetry does. So let's break prosopopoeia down a little bit, because it's, as I said, it's a generic term, and there's different things within that. So anthropomorphism is, that's more specific towards this idea of animal speaking, so in anthropomorphism, the, the voice is literally, you know, it's written in first person, I, and that I is the the animal or the tree or the, you know, whatever it is, the inanimate object, the dead, um, these things, the voice is coming from within those things. And then there's personification, <clears throat> or it's also pathetic fallacy is another term that uh, John Ruskin coined for personification, same thing. Personification is um, where you attribute human characteristics to a non-human thing. The great 
writer and ecologist John Muir, environmentalist. He um, he used personification a lot in his in his writing. He would talk about the uh, the trees thrilling gladly with excitement, and or we know that you know one of the most famous poems, um, the Shakespeare, uh, Wordsworth writing about the uh, wandering lonely as a cloud. Again, the human characteristic of loneliness being attributed to a cloud. Likewise, John Muir's glad excitement being attributed to a tree. So, yeah, moving towards now another exercise is to play about with your original idea and to change it and, and write from these other these other ways. So, use anthropomorphism possibly and take an idea and write from an animal, write from the perspective of the River Tay, write from the perspective of a tree. Right? You know, try and give it come from the I, I am, but when you're speaking I am, you're speaking as as the thing. And then try this similar thing. You could even take the same idea, the same thing, but instead of writing from the I, personify it, give human characteristics to the river tay or a tree or a but you're writing from a you're step back from it and you're portraying human characteristics onto that. So that's the exercise here at the end of this second part of the of this workshop. Welcome to part three of the Poetry Workshop. In this part of the workshop, I'm going to introduce you to a tool called the Five Factor Model, which I hope will help you develop the ideas that you've been scribbling down. And just to really build around those into a fuller, deeper poem or part prose, whatever is flowing more naturally for you. This uh, Five Factor Model, it actually came from, uh, I studied uh, psychology and psychotherapy and work for a time as a psychotherapist and then realized that I could bring this tool and use it to for character development and uh, sort of character based poems or a lot of people have um, I've done workshops previously and people have said that for their character development within their novels or whatever they're working on it's been really useful um, so the five factor model and what it is is you put into the centre, there's the situation or the character, the person, and then around that you have thoughts, emotions, behaviour and the biology or the physical sensation. Um, so in terms of, you know, if you've been writing from the perspective of a tree or a river, a river from using the anthropomorphism device, that would go in the centre um, and then you build around it. Um, so you might you might look at um, for example let's take the tree for example so the tree goes in the center here the tree is the center point so what what thoughts or beliefs might a tree have um, and then how does that link with emotions what emotions might that tree have what behaviors does that then cause these thoughts beliefs the emotions what behavior then goes on and then what's the physical sensation of being a tree? And how do all these things link together? How do emotions affect the physical sensation? How do behaviours affect the thoughts? How do thoughts then affect the emotions? And thoughts and beliefs are, are very closely linked, including beliefs of what a person or what a thing, or, you know, what somebody would think or believe about themselves. And that drives all this emotion and other stuff around it. One person that I uh, worked with said that they felt like their life was a can of spaghetti inside their head and whenever this they used this tool um, they felt like it separated out all those strands of spaghetti so they could see where, the, where it began, where it ended and where it crossed and wove in with the other ones. So again, that it can bring this uh, sort of depth or oh, my cat sneezing hairball um, so yeah it can just help give a bit of depth and in a way just another way to make sense or explore the world around you and bring that into the, the poems or the writing that you're working on now so I hope that's useful just again 
in the centre you've got the situation or the character and then around that you've got thoughts or beliefs, you have emotions, you have behaviour and you have biology and then you can explore all the, the ways they, they link together. Five factor models. I'm going to finish this workshop with a poem and it's a uh, yeah, poem that I wrote. It's um, certainly got an element of anthropomorphism in it in that I speak from the perspective of a book. Um, it also it also encapsulates a little bit of how important writing is for me. It's called Here I Am. Ah. Furball. Here I am. You may have met people who claim acceptance of their own mortality. They're fettling away to nothing, cell by spent cell. You may be one of them. I'm not. So I sought a vessel to carry me beyond my years. I found it in words. Spread myself across this sheet, thinking I'd cozy up in the dark between the covers. I'd wait here for hands like yours to thumb back the edge, to drench me with light. Then I, in one of those told you so moments would stare up and say, see, here I am, I live. But I never anticipated the time was dark, the emptiness of silence. And now I must plead that you don't close me back into the blank of it. Please break the spine, weigh me open, rip me from the bind and pin me to a wall or smother me behind glass, my ragged margins tucked inside a frame. If that's too much to ask, at least fold the corner of this page so you can find me again and I can see you there in a brief flood of light and life.